How are you doing this morning? Everybody came in fired up. I started hearing woohoos as soon as the lights came on. <laughs> We're ready to go. Spring has sprung. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for some nice, crisp weather. We sat on the porch this week. This, this every, just about every day we were able to sit out there and just enjoy being outside and hearing the birds and just the newness. I like it. So this morning we're going we're gonna to jump into worship. I have a couple of announcements first. I want to welcome you here. First of all, welcome to the house. Welcome you online all over the world. We're glad that you're joining us this morning. And I just want to let you know that um, obviously next week is Resurrection Sunday. Right? We're coming into that season again. Awesome. And so Pastor Kent's going to share a little bit with us today and just kind of get us fired up for that and, and leading into it. This year, the biblical calendar is a little bit different, if you haven't noticed. Usually, Resurrection Sunday and Passover are right there together. It's going to be a few weeks apart, so just, just making you aware of that. Passover Sunday will be April 28th. So we're going to have two celebrations. We're going to celebrate twice as much this year. We like to party around here. So then um, April, se- uh, April 7th, there will be baptism service. We're going to do a baptism service, pre-service, like we normally do at 930. So if you're interested in being baptized, now's the time to do it. And you can sign up. You can register for that on our Facebook page. And we'll get you registered. If um, any of you guys in the recovery crew, you can holler at me during the week and we'll get you registered for that. And we're excited about that. We love our baptism service. And we just, we're just, I've already got some people signing up. They've been asking for it, so it's time. So we're going to do us another baptism service, all right? Holy Spirit, we welcome you here this morning. We just invite your presence to come and overtake this service, overtake our lives, overtake us from the tops of our heads to the bottom of our feet, Lord. And I just ask that you just begin to flow even now like a river through every aisle, through every chair, through every heart, through every spirit. I call your spirits to attention and I say, let's worship him today in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. Let's worship.
sing it out. Jehovah Nisi fight my battles. Jehovah Jireh meet my need. Jehovah Rapha heal my body. Jehovah Shalom be my peace. Come on, let's go. Jehovah Nisi fight my battles. Jehovah Jireh. 
to worship like he's actually looking at us. You know, I want us to worship like we actually know that their creator God is looking at us. I want us to offer a sacrifice of praise as if the one who is bigger than the heavens is actually looking at us. I want you to see his face. So we're going to do verse two again, back into the chorus. But I want us to, as we worship and as we sing, that the Hebrew word for spontaneous song is tehillah. And that is the kind of praise that the Lord inhabits. 
He inhabits the spontaneous song of His people, the spontaneous overflow of your heart. So come on, just for a minute, let's just engage in song with Him. Just sing His name, sing whatever comes to your heart. Sing with gratitude, sing with thanksgiving, sing with supplication. A geyser gushing from our hearts. We lift up your name. Come and have it all praise God. Yeah, all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise belong. Praise belongs to you. All of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise belongs to you. And all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise belongs to you. All of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise belongs to you. Yeah, all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise.
Wonderful Lord Jesus, we worship you, we praise you, we bless you, we honor you. We thank you for your presence that's here. Lord, we came to worship you, to bless you, and to be empowered by your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy, your truth and your grace that will be released in this house today. We honor you, we bless you, and we give you glory for everything you're doing. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said... Amen. Can we give the Lord one more hand of praise here today? Amen. Before you sit down, find four, five, six people, tell us something really encouraging, and then you may be seated. Test one, two, three. Amen. Good morning. We got a lot of territory to cover today. So we're excited that you're here. We're excited those of you that are online. And thank you so much. Uh, we had a great day yesterday. Beverly and I were in Inslee. Have you ever been to Inslee? That's a wild place over in Inslee. I'm going to tell you that right now. If you've been to Inslee, you don't forget going to Inslee. But I'm going to tell you what, right in the middle of that place, a man of God named Pastor David Petway has built a church called Fresh Anointing House of Worship, and they are lighting up Inslee for the glory of God. And so, <laughs> Beverly and I both preached over there yesterday, and Beverly brought the fire, and it was so anointed. God's been giving Beverly a revelation. If you hadn't ever heard the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, which is actually how Jesus prayed it, I challenge you, listen to it. It's mind-blowing. And the interpretation, hopefully Beverly will share it in the next uh, few times we're together, the revelation of the Lord's Prayer actually will take a whole new meaning on. And so it's very, very powerful. And so we thank God for Pastor Petway over in Inslee and all the powerful things that he's accomplishing there. And we bless them today and bless the state of Alabama, right? And, and bless our nation. You can take me out of these monitors, if you will, and that'll cut, cut all that feedback for you. I'm going to talk to you just for a moment before we get into the main message today. I felt like the Holy Spirit's been talking to me about encouraging you, re-encouraging some of, some of us on the concept of the tithe. Now, I know that gets exciting. You know, isn't it something you never, ain't all the fellowship I have with people, nobody ever asked me in the midst of having coffee, Kent, how much money you got? Why? Because it's just taboo, right? We don't talk about that. Right, But in reality, Jesus spoke more about money than any other topic, including heaven, hell, angels, and demons. Why? It is the key to the spiritual life. And so I just want to encourage some of you, re-encourage some of us. Beverly and I have built our entire life on this one principle. 
It's the very first thing we learned about God was to be faithful in the tithe. Let me read the scripture. For I am the Lord, and I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob, yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances, and you've not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said... How do you return? God responds, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me or test me now on this, says the Lord of hosts, if I'll not open for you a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't even have room enough to receive it. Now, this is God Almighty, the Father, talking to, talking to us, and some can debate me on the theology of that scripture. You can debate me in the scriptures all you want to, but you can't debate my experience. My experience has been for almost 40 years now, and just so you understand what a tithe is, a tithe is not any, if you, you can give any amount you want, but a tithe is 10. So there's a difference between a tithe and offering. You can give all the offerings you want, and you can give any amount you want between you and God, but if you give a tithe, a tithe is 10%. That's what the word tithe means. Now, why is that important? 10 is the number in the Bible for testing. 10 plagues got them out of Egypt. 10 commandments, will you follow the Lord? 10 is the number of testing. God showed me right away. He said, the first thing I use to test someone's heart, have they returned to me or not, is the tithe. My uncle, who I didn't even know knew the Lord till he was 92, had a speech impediment his whole life. You couldn't even understand anything that he said. The first time he heard the Lord's, Lord's voice was at 14 years old when he was picking up Coke bottles on the side of the road because he was hungry, and a voice told him, go to the grocery store and get a job. I said, what do you mean a voice told you? He said, well, it was God. And I said, okay. And I said, what did happen when you went to the grocery store? He said, they told me they weren't hiring. I said, what did you tell him? He said, I told him you got to be hiring because God told me to come. And they said, well, we can't afford to pay you. He said, I didn't ask you for pay. God told me to come and go to work. So he went to work for no pay. He was such an amazing employee, he went from working for no pay to running the place. Come on. At 14 years old, the next thing, he, he said, the next thing the voice told me was tithe. He said, I didn't know what that meant. So I had to go study and find out what it meant. He said, I started tithing when I was 15 years old. And I've tithed every year of my life, and now I'm 92. He, he died one of the most wealthy men in the state of Tennessee. You couldn't get elected to, to the governorship or senator without him on your team. As a 14-year-old stutterer with a speech impediment that knew how to get a, you know what he told me? He said, Kent, tell people if they don't tithe, don't pray. I said, well, Uncle Rod, don't you think that God loves people even if they don't tithe? He goes, oh, yeah, God loves everybody. He said, but they don't have enough faith to get an answer. Touch your neighbor say, ouch. And so I want to encourage you. My wife Beverly and I started this, and most of the people think, well, if I ever get to the place that I can afford to tithe, then I will tithe. No, you will never get to the place you can afford to do anything if you don't obey God. So my wife, Beryl, and I started tithing when we were in debt to the IRS for $100,000 debt I owed because of my stupidity and drug, drug abuse on a $25,000 a year salary between us. And I promise you, every time we would make the decision to tithe, even though we couldn't pay any other bill or even buy food, God would show up and show out every time, and he's been doing it for 40 years in our life. And so I want to bless you, especially our recovery folks that are 
going through recovery and others, this principle is not something you wait to do later. This is something that you make a decision now. Do you want to live in God's economy or do you want to live in the world's economy? In the world's economy, there's nothing but curses. In God's economy, there's nothing but blesses, blessings. So touch your neighbor and tell him, I'm calling you blessed today in Jesus' name. And so, Father, I release a revelation in this house today of the tithe. And, Lord, I thank you over the next few weeks as we visit this subject, you're going to ignite supernatural faith and supernatural provision, and you're going to release people beyond boundaries that we have currently set on ourselves and limited the Holy One of Israel. And we say, God, we are returning to you with our whole hearts, and we expect the windows of heaven to open and to receive blessings that we don't even have room enough to receive. Receive in Jesus' name, and anybody in agreement shout it, amen. amen. Yes. I think I got a graphic for those that maybe, uh, uh, you got the next graphic that have uh, never, never tithed before. This is the way to give. You can give online, you can text to give, or you can give by mail. If you're old school like Beverly and I, you can write a check, which people never do anymore, do they? I still have a blue checkbook, little one. I like it. This is the way to give. The next slide, thank you for that. I have been challenged. I'm on day 29 of the Bible in 90 days. It takes about 15 minutes, and you can read the entire Bible in 90 days. Now, I don't know about you, but that's exciting to me. I've never done it, never thought you could do it, and it has been one of the most life-giving things I have done in a very long time. This is the app. If you... It's called Chronological, the Bible in 90 Days. It's on version. version is free of charge. You download it on your phone. I read it on my phone every morning. It's the first thing I do now to get, get that app open, read, that, read the scriptures. It's staggering to see things I'd never seen before. Just reading the scriptures all over again chronologically, it's a very, very cool way to understand the scriptures. It's imperative because our world that we're in right now, our culture is saying there is no truth that there is no baseline of truth. But I'm telling you, the Bible is truth. The Bible is full of the truth. Why do I believe that? The number one reason I believe it, there's almost 3,000 prophecies in it that's already been, been, been fulfilled. Written by 66 different authors over hundreds of years different span, and they all tell the same story. It's a supernatural book. And I promise you, if you get into it, it will transform form your life. So the Bible in 90 days. Why is that important? Because we got to know the truth. Most, every, no, I shouldn't say most, that's a bad word. A lot of people I meet just don't know the truth. They, they only believe what grandma believed or aunt Sarah believed or somebody else believed, but they've never read the book for themselves. And so this brings me to today's conversation that we're going to have is traditionally today is Palm Sunday. Traditionally, next Sunday is Easter. Easter is not in the book. Touch your neighbor and say, what? <laughs> Easter's not in the book. You can't find the word Easter in the book. Why? It's not true. Touch the other name or go, what? <laughs> Easter is named after the goddess Eshtar, which is the goddess of fertility, which was brought into existence by Constantine in 300 AD when he quit allowing God's people to celebrate God's feasts, quit letting them meet in their homes, and nationalized Christianity as a national religion and mixed pagan holidays with Jewish holidays and came up with Christian holidays. And it whacked the church to the point we went into the dark ages for 1,450 years because the enemy thought he could get us off by 
dealing with our calendar and our time. And I am staggered by the folks in Christianity next Sunday that will all be celebrating Easter, getting eggs out of a yard and eating chocolate. Which I have no problem with chocolate and I have no problem with eggs, but it has nothing to do with the power of the blood of the Lamb to redeem our souls from sin, sickness, and disease. And it dilutes the power of the season because we were originally called to celebrate Passover. When Jesus went to the cross, he ate the Passover meal. After Jesus was raised from the dead, they celebrated the Passover meal. Why? Because Passover is about one thing and one thing only. It is, I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from the hand of the enemy. Now, normally we get away with it because Passover and Easter falls on the same Sunday. But every leap year, which we're in right now, that's not the case. Next Sunday, traditionally, it's Easter, but Passover is three weeks away. So, people will show up here next Sunday expecting a cantata and some eggs and chocolate. And they're going to be very disappointed. Now, we're going to be talking about resurrection But we're not going to be talking about Easter because we don't believe in the God of fertility. We believe in Yahweh, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So I had to kind of get you prepared uh, so that you don't show up. I mean, we can dress up if you want to. That's all right. But, you know. Thank you, Jesus. Read the book. Touch somebody, tell them, read the book. Touch somebody else, tell them, read the book. So for the next two Sundays, I want to talk to you about the power of the resurrection. By the way, I don't have time to teach on this today, but one thing about Easter is they they put the the death and the resurrection together. But it wasn't together. Jesus died on Passover. Not the day before, not the day over. And he got up on first fruits. So if you don't know the feast, you don't even know the timeline. And so it's very important that we know the book, that we understand why. Because this is designed every year to release the same power that was released over 2,000 years ago when it happened. It's not a, that's my whole point about the Easter bunny and the, uh, all Easter eggs and all that, it dilutes it and makes it a historical event instead of the power of actually what it is. John G. Lake, one of my heroes that moved from Spokane, Washington to South Africa and saw over 100,000 notable miracles. A powerful preacher wrote on the victory of the resurrection And he called it Heaven's Challenge. He writes, Christianity through Jesus Christ stepped into the arena of world religions as a challenger. The Son of God, just as the ancient athlete did, threw down his gauntlet and challenged the religions of the world to take it up. Heaven's challenge still stands. Sophisticated religions, uncertainties, philosophical illusions, and delusions have claimed the world's interest. But heaven's challenge stands just as vigorously today as it ever did. So long as the blessed Word of God lives in the world, so long shall that challenge endure. Other religions were aged, old, ancient religions. Zoroaster had lived, taught his purification by fire, and worshipped the sun, the fire god. 
Zor- Zoroaster could conceive only one possibility, a purifying of the human soul in a process of fire cleansing. There could be no other. That was the conclusion of the ancient world. Buddha followed about 500 B.C., but with no better hope than Zoroaster. His idea was oblivion, personality lost, individuality gone, and merged into the great void without distinctive consciousness. Mohammed came later about 550 years after Jesus Christ. His heaven was a haven of everlasting sensuality. Then in modern days, Mormonism followed with its spiritual marriages and dream of eternal polygamy, all abominable to the spirit of the Son of God and unlike Christianity as anything could be. Into the muck and the mess and the darkness came the Son of God with the glory of holiness and with divine righteousness and with a heavenly purity, with angelic estate, with unending consciousness, perpetuated individuality, life forevermore with resurrection from the dead. Man's enjoyment of God eternally. You yourself, a son of God, like the son of God himself, in his likeness immortalized, Heaven stood aghast. Earth stood aghast. Hell stood aghast when Jesus stepped into the arena. Could he accomplish the thing he talked about? Was there power in heaven or earth to revolutionize the nature of man, change the darkness, take away sin, and eradicate the night from our soul? Could the darkened soul be lightened from on high? Could the spirit of man begotten in iniquity be changed into loveliness, heaviness, and holiness? Could the personality of man be preserved? Were Christians going to die just like others die? Did he truly possess eternal life? Could he impart it to others? Was Jesus Christ a boaster or a savior? Christianity did not come to the world to apologize for its existence or to beg for a place to live. It came as heaven's champion, for it has the champion soul. It will bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. And that very champion consciousness is the soul of a Christian being born of God. The Christian is champion of the Son of God and a demonstrator of his salvation. He is the champion of God. He can't be anything else. And as he is, so are we in this world. In our day, we've almost come to the place where the world is being taught to believe that the message of Christianity is morality. Be decent. Don't act like a pig. And keep the beast under control. This is about the whole message of modern Christianity, but Jesus Christ never wasted his time establishing mere morality. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, declared immortality to be the goal of Christianity. And its attainment, the purpose of God for you and me, it says, I will raise him up the last day, said Jesus. I will give him eternal life. The dead in Christ will rise first. Not morality, immortality. Touch your neighbors, tell them, you're awesome. No religion in the world except Christianity has ever suggested resurrection as its declared intent. Who in the world was bold enough to suggest resurrection? What dying creature could? It was only the Son of God himself out of heaven with the knowledge of immortality and eternal life that would dare to suggest such a climax for mankind. If there were no other evidence of Jesus Christ's eternal superiority but that, 
it would be enough. Who alone has immortality? In him was life, and the life was the light of man. He that believes, lives and believes in me shall never die. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What a marvelous Redeemer. Christianity stands alone, absolutely unique. No other religion of earth has our hope, our consciousness, our perception, or our power. I fear sometimes that in our modernity, we modern people somehow have lost the spirit of original Christianity. To be honest, I've quit telling people I'm a Christian, it's too diluted too perverted, too politicized. I like to tell people I'm a follower of Christ. We've lost the punch of it. We've lost the overcoming power of it. We're begging the devil for a place in the world, apologizing for our faith in God, trying to conform our religion and faith to the mind of the world. Salvation is the transforming power of God. Jesus Christ looked upon the world which was saturated with sin and fashioned in iniquity and said that the task was not too much for him. The biggest contract in this universe was undertaken back in the eternal ages when one time in the council of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, the responsible creator, became the responsible savior and settled the sin question. By offering himself as the Savior of the world, he formed and completed our redemption. Whoever believes on him who sent me has eternal life. His dying on the cross was just the first incident in the connection with our redemption, but it was not the conclusive proof. If Jesus had died on the cross and the process of salvation was over, there would not be redeemed sinners today. David was sitting on the mountainside one afternoon watching his sheep and his spirit traveled into the realms of God and he began to observe as a seer does the things that were taking place and broke out shouting. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts for man even among the rebellious also that the Lord God might dwell among them. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, and let the King of glory come in. This is the Christ of God. That is his salvation. This was a battle of worlds. It was not a battle of earthly religions. It was the battle of every power of light and darkness in heaven and earth. Jesus Christ, the champion of righteousness and salvation, had to make good or like the philosophers, pass into oblivion at the grave. Instead of being the life giver, he would have just been the founder of another philosophy. The resurrection morning came. Jesus, discussing his life, had said, I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it back again. He took it at his will. He commanded life. He lived and death became a captive. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was victor. And there is none like him in all the universe. He came out of the battle with the keys of death and hell. No other soul in heaven or earth had such an experience. None other had even ever challenged death. No other has ever taken death and hell captive. Jesus Christ stood unique in the earth, in hell and in heaven. When Jesus came forward in the resurrection, something breathed and pulsated in him that had never breathed or pulsated before. It was new. It was called eternal life he used new vocabulary the ordinary language was not big enough he said all power is given unto me in heaven and earth who else in the universe had experienced such a thing none but the son of god all power language is christian vocabulary only 
Christianity came from the heart of the glorified. Christianity is a heavenly triumph. Christianity is 100% supernatural. That is God possessing man. Just as God breathed the breath of life into Adam, so Jesus Christ breathed upon his disciples. If he could breathe into them this heaven-born life, they would be heaven-born like himself. If he could breathe this consciousness of triumph unto them, they would become triumphant also. If they could take the deathless life of Christ, they would become deathless likewise. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. In Peter's sermon on Pentecost, he gives a revelation that no other writer gives. Peter's broken heart was perceptive. He saw into the glory. He saw Jesus ascending to the throne of God. He saw the Almighty God receive him at the throne. He observed what took place. He said, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you now see and hear. He saw Jesus get the eternal saving marvel for universal distribution to all mankind. Right then, Jesus became the world's Savior, the Savior of all mankind. He now possessed the saving grace, the Holy Spirit. God had fulfilled his promise. It was completed. His Savior had done it. It made him heaven's high priest. He had qualified as high priest of things eternal. It was his right now to pour out the Holy Spirit on every hungry heart that was ready to receive. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and so may you be as well. Potent, powerful. We serve such a dualism of Christianity giving the devil power. The devil doesn't have power. He has been defeated by the blood of the Lamb. Don't say the devil made you do it. He ain't got the power to make you do it. Just say, I did it. And I'm sorry for it, and I don't want to do it again, and I received the Holy... Come on, somebody. My whole mandate to you today is to get you to believe in the power of the resurrection, not when you die today. Let me give you three powerful points I believe the Lord showed me. Number one, the power of resurrection. The goal is to fulfill purpose. Here's what Paul the Apostle said about the resurrection. And I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus and to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. Resurrection's not waiting on, waiting on me to get in the grave. Resurrection's working in me today. Lean over and touch your neighbor around the belly and tell him resurrection's working in you today. Watch this. To experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me, I will be one with him in his sufferings and become like him in his death. Only then will I be able to experience complete oneness with him in his resurrection from the realm of, the, of death. I admit that I have not yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose for which Christ has laid hold of me to make me his own. Resurrection power is not when you die. Resurrection power is where you start. But we've watered down Christianity to the place people don't even know what they're receiving. They believe they're receiving another philosophy or a get, get better message or a get self-help message. Christianity has no self-help in it. There is no self-help. Vain is the help of man. The only help we have is when I die and he lives and his spirit, come on somebody, and his spirit comes inside of me. And I'm not preaching to you by theology. I'm preaching to you by experience. My wife and I, y'all know our story. She was a drug dealer. I was a drug addict. She sat in a car out here 
50 yards from where I'm preaching today 40 years ago and reached into an ashtray to get a joint to smoke it just to forget her troubles. And the audible voice of God said, what are you doing digging around in this trash? It's time you came unto me, my child, and wave after wave after wave of resurrection power flew, came over her life and her body and her spirit. And she was born again in the front seat of a car about to smoke a joint. That's resurrection power power she didn't come back to see me saying I gotta get better she didn't come back to me saying I've gotta change she came back changed something had shifted Something that was natural became supernatural. Something that was holding her was gone. Something that had blinded her was gone. Now she could see who she had believed in. It was only two weeks earlier I sat in a denominational church in this city with a guy preaching. I don't even remember what he said. I just know it felt like a physical hand had a hold of my heart and I was about to die. And the way I grew up, you couldn't pray in your seat. You had to go down front. So I didn't pray, Lord, save me. I said, Lord, let him shut up and quit preaching. Because I'm about to die in the pew. I got those words out of my mouth to the Lord. This young man stopped preaching, walked down to me, grabbed me by my hand. He said, it's time you got right with God. I said, yes, it is. He walked me down front. Six old-time saints got a hold of me. Three were hanging, hang on, saying, hang on. Three were saying, let go. I didn't know whether to hang on or let go, but I tell you what, about two and a half minutes later, resurrection power came inside of me and changed my life. Self-help is no help. It is not by might. It is not by power. But by my spirit. That's Christianity. You say, well, why do I know Christians that act so terrible? Maybe they've never had this experience. My Bible says... A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. A fresh well can't poison you. And the poison I hear coming out of some believers makes me think they've never had an encounter with the true resurrected Christ. Resurrection power, Paul Talked about that. Readily available to me and you now. This dualism in the body of Christ that there's a bad and good in you. That's not true. The bad dies and the good lives. You say the bad doesn't ever manifest again. Oh, it can try like Paul the Apostle. Remember him? It says he was on a ship. Got in a shipwreck. Wound up on an island. They built a fire. A snake came out of the fire grabbed hold of him, what did they say? No, they didn't. They said, you must be a murderer. And you know what? That's who he was. And they said, we're going to wait to see if he doesn't swell up and die. It says, Paul shook off the beast. Then they said, he's not a murderer, he must be a God. What was that? That was Paul demonstrating the power of the resurrection when it comes inside of a believer. That old thing might try to rise up and you get, but it can't hold you there. It's got to let you go. We're to experience the power of the resurrection now. It's not an event that happened thousands of years ago in, a, in the past or an event that's going to happen in the future. Both are true, but it's available now. Second, quick, the revelation. Paul prayed it. I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Somebody shout faith. 
then your lives will be an advertisement of what this immense power is as it works through you. You're to be a billboard of the power of the resurrection. This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor, supreme authority in the heavenly realm. And now he is exalted as first above every ruler. Ab above every ruler. You know, I'm going to get down here on this left side. I feel like y'all get ignored over here a lot of the times. I'm coming over here to preach for a while. Stay over here. Now he is exalted as first above every ruler, every authority, every government. I got news for somebody. Jesus trumps Trump. Jesus trumps Biden. Jesus trumps whoever may be in the White House. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I thank God for America and I thank God for this nation. I've traveled in 80 other ones. There ain't no better place to live than here. But I'm going to tell you what. The political environment of our nation is not going to shape the world. What's going to change the world is being born from above by the power of the Holy Spirit. So be encouraged. Whoever graces the White House... Vote your conscience, vote your convictions, but whoever winds up there, just know somebody's in charge and it ain't them. When he raised Christ from the dead, he seated him far above governments and principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness. Quit giving the world and the devil so much power. At best, God says he has a hook in the jaws of the nations. He sets one up and puts one down. God ain't worried. He ain't in heaven going, oh, myself. Quit being a Christian, acting like you're so worried about the future of a nation or anything else. I ain't worried. Why? In the end, I get up. The worst thing to you is you die, and then you get up. We're to advertise that. You should be the most peaceful person. You should show up at work, and when they start all that political nonsense, you should say, hold the phone. I ain't listening to that nonsense. They ain't in charge. The king's in charge. I will lift up my eyes to the heavens where my help comes from. My help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. Why you keep walking around like the devil's got dominion and the world's got authority? It was stripped from them with the resurrection power of God. People of the resurrection. I like it. I'm preaching in the dark and the light. <laughs> you get the light fixed over here. <laughs> We're to advertise it. Not just experience it. It should flow through you. Yes. Beverly and I were in Belgium. I was preaching. Be honest, the worst message I've ever preached. Just one of those, you know? Just, whew. Felt defeated, felt discouraged. Right when I was walking out the door, this gypsy family came with a two-year-old baby. They said, he's dying, kidney failure. Would you pray? I felt so defeated, so discouraged, but I took that baby in my arms and I prayed a half prayer. Something, you know, out of discouragement. Lord, help him. Fix him. Something like that. It wasn't, you know, went on discouraged about my business. Because we all get discouraged because I, I told you a word a while ago. It said faith. That's what the enemy's after to get you out of that. 
My friend Lester Summerall used to say, starve your doubt to death and feed your faith. 14 years went by. Beverly and I were in Holland with our family preaching in Holland, not Belgium, in Holland, preaching the word. At the end of the night, this family came and said, hey, we want to introduce you to somebody. I said, fine, I didn't know them. This strapping, beautiful, 16-year-old soccer star. They said, do you remember that kid? I said, no, ma'am. They said, when we brought him to you in Belgium, he was dying. He said, you took him in your arms and you prayed a prayer. She said, I don't mean to be crude, but when we put him in the back seat to drive home, he urinated all over the car and we rejoiced all the way home. Come on, somebody. That's the power of the resurrection. If Jesus can defeat and destroy death, he can heal kidneys, he can heal cancer, he can heal drug addiction, he can heal sickness, he can heal depression, he can heal diabetes, anything that's trying to destroy you. You say, how do I get in on this? I call this activation. Some of you aren't in on it because you didn't know what was happening to you at baptism. You were baptized into a church or into a denomination or into a philosophical concept of Christ. But true baptism says this. At baptism, sharing in his death by our baptism means that we were co-buried with him. This is why, this is why we don't sprinkle. We're co-buried with him. So that when the Father's glory raised Christ from the dead, we also are raised with Him. We have been co-resurrected with Him so that we could be empowered to walk in the freshness of new life. So whatever you were prior to baptism, whoever you were, whatever had been done to you, whoever had abused you, whoever had misused you, whatever wrong choices you've made, whatever perversion had gotten a hold of you, whatever demonic activity that had been holding you back from your purpose and your destiny, the reason that its power is broken is because you are dead. When you go under, you're died. You're died. You conclude yourself, that person no longer exists. That person I created, that person that was against my original design, that person that was trying to fight my destiny, that person no longer exists. And when I come up out of the water, The same power that raised Jesus from the dead fills my life and empowers me to walk it out. Let's keep reading. It's good. Is there another slide? For since we were permanently grafted into him to experience a death like his, then we are permanently grafted into him to experience a resurrection like his and the new life that it imparts. Could it be any clearer that our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power? Why did Israel have to go through the Red Sea and why did God close it back? 
so that they could never go back to what they had been delivered from. Hold on. And because if you were baptized without this revelation, you may need to be rebaptized. Because Paul came upon a group of believers in Acts 19 and said, Hey, he was Paul came in town looking for power. He, they, they weren't operating in it. Paul said, have y'all received the Holy Spirit? They said, we hadn't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. Paul said, then how were you baptized? They said, unto repentance. Paul said, no, oh, no. I need to rebaptize you. Into the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, after he baptized him with this revelation, they came up out of the water and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. And may I just go on record to say, we are a tongue-talking, Holy Ghost-believing, prophetic, supernatural, healing, delivering, prophetic crew. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And for us, the greatest proof of the resurrection is that we speak in tongues. That's the greatest proof. Why? It says, if I don't go away, I can't send another one. If I don't go away, I can't send another one. And I can't tell you how powerful it was. Beverly had her experience. I had had my experience. Beverly and I were in a worship service. She's raised Baptist. I was raised Pentecostal. She thought she didn't need it, and I thought you had to earn it. That was our backup background. We're sitting in a worship service. We're worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden, Bev goes, full bore tongues. I'm like, I hit her. I'm like, how'd you get that? She's like, I don't know. It just came out. Like, I was like, it just came out. That's not supposed to happen. Man, I was determined I had to have it. I went home and I, I said, well, I, we got a clean house. I took all Bev's jade Buddhas and smashed them on the patio and got rid of the devil food cake out of the fridge and <laughs> all the devil ham and all, everything with that. On, we got, I start. I got to make way. I got to clean up. It took me about six months of that nonsense. Bev's enjoying her new resurrection life, waiting on me, and I'm floundering around out here with my religious spirit. And then finally one day it hit me. Oh, what a day that was. And the, to realize the reality of the resurrection because the same spirit that raised him up was now living in me. God, I was so happy to speak in tongues. I had a job. I was a salesman at the time selling real estate, and I was taking people around on tours I'd talk to him for about 15 minutes, and I'd run to the bathroom. But like, thank you, Jesus, I still got it. And I'd run back out, and, you know, and, and it, it, they thought I had diarrhea. You know, I was running back and forth to the bathroom. I was just happy to be filled with And I'm just as happy today to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. We were co-crucified with him to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us so that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. Because obviously a dead person is incapable of sinning. You say, Kit, you're telling me that after you're baptized, you never sin again? Nope, that's not what I said. Sin no longer has dominion over me. 
oh, I may make a mistake and I may say something stupid or get angry in a moment and I shouldn't do something wrong, but it doesn't have power to hold me. That's why God gave me repentance. As soon as the Holy Spirit convicts me, I'm repent, I'm out, and I'm back on my way. Why? That has no longer a dominion over me to keep me stuck in cycles of it. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Right? Last one, the impartation. Yes, God raised Jesus to life. This is Christianity in a sentence. God raised Jesus to life. This is Christianity in one sentence. God raised Jesus to life. To life. How many of you know dead people don't participate? Jesus wasn't in the grave going, he was dead. And by one act of God's grace and power, what had never been done in the history of the world, a dead Savior got up. Why is that the key to Christianity? Because Christianity is not about do, it's about done. It is Christ that will raise you from the dead, not you raising yourself to, from the dead. It will be, it's Christ that will, can save your dead marriage. It's Christ that can save your dead business. It's Christ that can save your, your dead relationships because of drug addiction. It is Christ who can save your dead dreams that you thought you were too far. Why did he let Abraham and Sarah wait till they had no part to play in it? Because God gets glory when he only does it all by himself. Why do we worship so radically on Sunday? Because we had nothing to do with the goodness that we're enjoying. All we did was worship, and he did everything. But some of you don't worship like others because I think some of you think you got a part to play in it. Like me and Jesus. No, it ain't you and Jesus. It's just Jesus all by himself. And the same spirit, look at this. Yes, God raised Jesus to life, and since God's spirit of resurrection lives in you, he will also raise your dying body to life by the same spirit that breathes life into you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. This is resurrection. This is what we celebrate, if anything, the next couple of weeks. It's the power of resurrection. Calling those things are as not as though they should be. Speaking to dead things, telling them to live again. This is resurrection power. Christianity is totally supernatural. and This is what we're supposed to be walking in. This is what we're supposed to celebrate. This is the lifestyle we're supposed to live. There should be a marked difference. If you've experienced Christ, there should be a marked difference in your life. It's not you got a little bit better. It's like something changed. I'm not saying Paul said, I'm not all the way there. But one thing I keep doing, I keep forgetting those things that are behind and I keep pressing ahead of that which is ahead. I'm not where I want to be, but I sure ain't where I, come on, I used to be. Come on, somebody. Can somebody thank God for that? I'm not where I want to be, but I sure ain't where I used to be, and I ain't staying here forever. I'm moving on with the Lord. Stand up with me. Touch your neighbor, tell him I'm pressing on. Tell him, touch somebody, tell him I'm pressing on. Don't you love that part of that scripture where he says that I may be a, have a fellowship of his sufferings so I can know the power of his resurrection. The, I believe the only purpose of suffering is so you'd know the power of his resurrection. Because everything I've suffered, he's resurrected me from. 
This is the way the kingdom works. And so before we dismiss today, I think, I perceive, there may be people here, you've never had this encounter of the Holy Spirit. Oh, you may love God and love people and want to get better, but you've never received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. You've never been baptized like that. So there's two things I want to recommend. Number one, April 7th, we're going to be doing water baptism. If you need to be baptized, you can go online and register, and we'll baptize you the morning of April 7th. If, or you need to be rebaptized. But two, you may be here today, and you say, Kent, I may have been a Christian for 40 years, but I've never received the Holy Spirit. I've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I've never received that resurrection power on the inside of me. Before you leave today, we'll pray for you. Because the Bible says all we got to do is lay hands on you and impart to you the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you what, it'll be on like Donkey Kong when you get the Holy Spirit. That's one thing the devil doesn't want to happen for you. Bev was preaching yesterday in Birmingham talking about when our uh, Preston's dad was 16 and started going out with other people in cars. Bev would throw her physical body on the cars of his friends in our driveway, full bore tongues. I apply the blood of Jesus, every demon in hell. That and she, she wouldn't let him leave the driveway without it. I think they're still alive today and doing well because of that. Come on, somebody. There's a power in it. There's power in the Holy Spirit. To build up your holy faith and to shift things in the spirit realm. So before we do anything else today, you're here and you say, Kent Maddox, that's me. I've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not, I don't have that power in my life, but I want it. If that's you, throw a hand up and wave it at me. All over. If that's you, all right? Would you, if, if you want it and you want prayer for that, I want you to slip out of your seat and come down here as quick as you can. Come on. And then we'll, we'll get everybody settled and we'll dismiss in case there's people that need to leave because I know there's a lot of people that have other places to go today. Just come make one line across the front. Nobody's standing behind anybody. We need just one straight line. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence lord holy spirit like this welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. 
Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Now those that are here, you can feel the presence of the Lord, can't you? It's a reality. I want you to look at me. In just a moment, we're going to have our prayer team. We have pastoral team and prayer team that will come join me. And in a moment, we're just going to simply ask you to lift your hands like an act of surrender. Receiving, so not now, but I mean in a minute we'll ask you. And it's just as like, I'm open. That's what that says. And somebody will lay their hands on you and say, receive the Holy Spirit. Now here's what Luke says. It says, if you ask you shall receive if you seek you and if you the door's gonna get open because nobody asks a father for a piece of bread and gets a serpent or asks for an egg and gets a scorpion right how much more will your heavenly father give the holy spirit the gift of the holy spirit to those who ask him it's that simple you're asking and god's giving you're receiving and he's giving it to you now your mind may try to get in the way I've had this experience there's a lady I won't embarrass her here she's part of our team been here for 25 years she came to a prayer line like this I prayed for her like we're going to pray for you she received but she didn't speak in tongues until she got home and she tells a story I think it's the funniest thing she said I struggled in my mind with it she said Ken I'll be honest I got home and I had to piece so bad, I didn't know what to do. I was trying to get my key in the door. I was about to wet my pants. She said, and I ran in there and I was all flustered. I ran in there and finally got in the house and got set down on the toilet. She said, I got through doing what I was supposed to do. And all of a sudden, out of my belly came a river of living water. And I started speaking in tongues and been speaking in tongues. So don't get confused that the Holy Spirit some kind of holy something that's not going to meet you right where you are. This is a reality. This is a transaction that's about to take place, an impartation. All right, you ready? So I'm going to ask all of our team to come get in front of you. Come on, team. Would you please make your way in front? Make sure every person has somebody in the proximity to be in front of them. Let me go ahead and pray for you guys. If y'all need to slip out, there's no, no harm in that. Father, we thank you for everything that you've done and what you're about to do. And these folks, don't start praying yet, though, but make sure you're standing in front of them. All right? Make sure you're standing in front of them. Anybody needs to slip out, we bless you guys, and we'll see. I'll be back preaching again next week on resurrection. Be praying for everybody that's coming expecting Easter. We bless them. All right. Guys, would y'all just lift your hands as an act of surrender? Say out loud with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you were raised from the dead. And you're alive today. And your promise was this. I will go away, but I will send you another one. The Holy Spirit that will be your comforter, your teacher, and your guide. He is the Spirit of truth and will lead me into all truth. Jesus, you said you will receive power from on high. The Holy Spirit filling you and baptizing you. And on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled and they all spoke in tongues. So today, according to your word, I ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, give me your Holy Spirit. Father, I seek the Holy Spirit. Father, I knock on the door 
that you said would be open to me the power of the Holy Spirit. So now I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit by faith now in Jesus' name. Come on, receive. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Those of you that have a prayer language, just start praying in your prayer language with us. Hey, Dennis and Linda, can y'all help me over here with some guys? Linda, can y'all help me? There's some guys over here that need prayer. Oh, So those in your seat, stretch your hands toward these people that are receiving today. Oh, thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> oh, glory, 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 glory. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for the same power that raised you from the dead, filling your people now with power from on high. Power over sin, power over sickness, power over disease, power to follow the Lord, power to walk, power of holiness, power of strength, power of joy, power of holiness, power of being set apart, separated for your kingdom purposes. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, robo sede ba shedi araba kamro goria ba she araba. Oh, reba la 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 bamba re re bombo lo lo bo shende ala ba la manga da. He re re bando lo bo lo bo ria da be ya. Oro lo borro bolo mo shele ababa e la barra manna lo lo bo she pere bambra ge raba je la brande a no oh ya rara baba e le 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 bombro shendere ambara ra bo she de amba oh oro bo she abara maka oh ya rara barre marara bandere a bo she Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Those of that are still participating, can you just lift your hands and thank the Lord for what He's doing right now in these people's lives? Whoa, glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, Oh, glory, 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 glory. Glory, 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 glory. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's a couple right here. Uh, sir, you've got glasses on. I don't know if this is your wife beside you, if you're together. Yeah. I saw a safe with a combination. And the Lord says, get ready. He's about to unlock some things for you. You've been through a season 
And it's been a particular trying season on some levels and then some great things on some other levels. But God says you've been contending for something to get unlocked concerning your family, concerning your destiny, concerning your future. God says, get ready. I I see the Lord's ear at that safe and He's clicking one number and when it moves, something opens, something shifts and what you've believed only by faith, now you're going to taste and see that the Lord is good and has unlocked that which has been locked up for you in Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, Lord. Jane, there's a lady right beside you being healed right now. Her physical body is being healed. The enemy has come to try to to do something in your body to bring to weaken you. Lay your hands on her, Jane. She's being healed right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we give you praise. 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 There's a gentleman, you're waving your hand, you got glasses hung on your neck. You, sir. You, you have been hungering and, hungering and thirsting for a revelation from God. Get ready. You're about to have a visitation of the Lord that's going to move you into a whole new insight into things you've been looking for from the Word of God. And you're about to have a spirit of revelation on you that you've not had yet in this point of your journey. And it's going to catapult you into the future in Jesus' name. God, we give you praise. God, we give you glory. God, we give you praise. Oh, thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of things transpiring. And and so obviously you're still here for a reason. If you're still here, find somebody right now and just pray for them and release something. If you're still in the room, find somebody. Because God's healing. God's, God's wanting to prophesy. God's wanting to speak words of life. Yeah, just find somebody because you're still here for a reason. Release a word, release a healing, release a prophecy, release an understanding. Speak it to the future. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's a couple way in the back. Yes, sir. Are y'all together? Married? I see you've been praying about a house. And there's, this is wild. This is going to come to you in a supernatural way. It's, it's a new, it's a new, something new's happening. And it's like old things are being passed away and new things are coming to you. Get ready. There's going to be a geographical shift, a new location that's going to show you that it's a new day and God's going to provide you something beyond what you could have ever dreamed, thought, or imagined. And it's going to be a sign to you God says, you've said, I want to build you a house. God says, you watch me build you a house. And you watch me provide you a house. And it's going to cause your faith to soar into the heavens. And you'll be a blessing to a lot of people in that place in Jesus' name. Can somebody just give the Lord a hand of praise for all that he's doing in here today? Thank you, Lord. Keep praying. Stay around if you want. Be blessed. We love you. We'll see you next week.